Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our first um, of our South to South exchanges. Um, you are most welcome today, and I'd like to also say Xia Hao for our colleagues in China and Bom Dia to our colleagues in, um, in our South American countries. Um, and I hope today is going to prove to be an interesting session. Um, we very much had uh, fun in preparing it. As you'll see, it is the first of a six-part knowledge exchange, which we have developed as part of our Interact Bio program. And it really aims to help and strengthen the capacity of city regions um, who we are at the moment working with to integrate nature into land use. So we're just going to do a couple of um, points of order and I'll just bring up the agenda. If we can just go to the agenda, please. Thank you. So my name is um, Ursula Wellman. I am the manager or I'm, I'm the manager for biodiversity and nature with the ICLI Africa Secretariat. And um, today on the call, uh, we also have um, some esteemed colleagues from all over the world joining us and who will reflect and share on their, um, on their journeys. Uh, we have Xu Zhu from our um, Chinese regional office. We have Mr. Precious Stone Rapotswa, who is the municipal manager from, sorry, I, um, oh, shall I do the introduction for later? Uh, I'm not sure you can confirm. Do you want to share from your side or are you happy for me to share? And then just happy, in the slide. happy for you to share, happy for you to share. Okay, I'll move on to the speaker slides and then so that it can align with your introduction. Okay, so otherwise I can always do the speaker introductions afterwards. Okay, that's fine then, let's do that. All right, we'll go to the speaker introduction a little bit later um, and maybe then we can just move to our webinar objectives. Um, So thank you very much, Bongi. So our webinar objectives for today is really to reflect on the road. Um, you were all part um, in some way of obviously the, the work in preparation to go to COP. You might have um, actually participated in the COP um, or you might have um, learned, been learning from the COP. Um, either way, there have been great journeys and the support that we envisage obviously to provide to the cities and the subnational governments, you know, to kind of localize these learnings is really what today's webinar is, is about. It's also to provide an overview of these developments and really to guide and assist you with your um, supporting or rather strengthening the reporting mechanisms through the cities with nature and the regions with nature um, platform. So if we can just go to our integrated action slide, please. Um, the integrate, just to explain a little bit about our project. Sorry, it's one back. Okay. So our integrated action on biodiversity, the Interact Bio project, it is an initiative that is funded by the German Federal Ministry and it forms part of their um, international climate change initiative. And in this specific project, a Global South project, it is implemented in Brazil, Tanzania, India, South Africa, China, and Colombia. And we are very, very happy that we have also indeed managed to secure and get speakers um, who uh, represent these specific countries. And maybe I think with that, if we can go to our speaker slide, please, Bongi. So we are honored to today have um, Xu Zhu, um, the regional director of, of our um, ICLI East Asia Secretariat joining us today. And then also as mentioned, Mr. Precious Stone Rapotswa, who's the municipal manager for the Waterberg district and the municipality. And speakers, it would be amazing if you are online, if you can actually switch on your cameras just whilst we um, introduce you. Then we also have joining from the city of Barranquilla, um, Ma Maria Amaya Saad, um, I think might be oh, no, already online. And then um, also 
um, from South America. We've got Dr. A Dr. Angela Cruz Guerrero, uh, who is the director um, of the Department of Green and Sustainable Development in the Municipal Secretary of Green Environment. And then uh, we also have Ingrid Kutzier, who's the director for biodiversity joining us today as well. So I think last but not least, before we dive into the meat of our session, I just would like to set some house rules or rather kind of go to the um, housekeeping slides as we like to call them. Uh, please ensure if you're a participant or you know, joining us, um, if you can please keep your audio and video disabled. Um, importantly to note, uh, the session is being recorded. So by your participation, you are consenting to it. Um, and then uh, you're welcome to also um, use the chat function to post any questions throughout the session. Um, we'll obviously try and get to these questions whilst we um, are live. Um, but I think the chat function is also a super, super great way of just using it to say hi, who we have in the room. Uh, so please. where you're from um just also i mean your organization as well as your location so that we can also see who's actually joining us and then we we'll also do a post session survey um where you can then join us what you where you can actually then let us think and we'll post a link to that a little bit later but i think in that case without further ado let me hand over to mr shu Zhu, who will be um sharing his um experiences of um of actually, or rather setting the scene for us and the insights that he has gathered and um, also as um, at COP, 20, COP, COP that was held in 2022, so COP15 uh, held in Montreal of last year. So Shu, I think if you are available, if I can hand over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Osala. Let me uh, try to share my uh, screen if you allow. Yeah, thank you. Can you see my uh, slides? Yes, we can. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, colleagues uh, and friends. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this uh, uh, first knowledge sharing session under the Interact Bio projects. We are also excited that uh, my region, in particular China, is now part of this uh, second phase of the project to uh, have this uh, opportunity to cooperate with the uh, different cities and countries from uh, uh, different regions. So I will try to give an outline about what we observe and learned as the outcome for the engagement of our constituency of subnational and local governments uh, at the COP15. And also uh, in my presentation, I will also give an, a brief summary about the actions from my region, particularly China, you know, uh, 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 during and post COP15. So uh, as you know that uh, this COP15 was quite uh, uh, spatial because it happened during the pandemic. You know, it has two phases. And first phase was in China uh, in 2021. And last year, we welcomed the second phase eventually in Montreal in December. Uh, uh, during this uh, COP15, we successfully organized the seventh uh, summit for subnational governments and cities, or in short, the Cities Summit, which was a, a, a global milestone to welcome significantly strengthened contributions from all subnational governments and cities to the new global biodiversity uh, framework, which was also an uh, official parallel event to the COP15, holding two days uh, in December. And the, during the summit, uh, as a uh, uh, first time, we also worked uh, closely with our partners to host a subnational governments and cities pavilion for eight days from 8th to 18th of December, focused on uh, providing more uh, opportunity for exchange and thematic sharings uh, for the participating local and subnational governments. This was also a very large scale event with more than 1,500 1, registered participants and also more than 200 subnational local government leaders uh, represented with uh, also more than 400 global regional local organizations, you know, uh, make rich contribution to uh, various topics and sessions and exchanges during the two-day summit 
plus the eight days of pavilion events. The summit was co-hosted by ICLE, uh, the CBD Secretariat, uh, together with the Regions 4, and also, of course, the host government of Quebec and the city of Montreal, with a strong support also from China as the presidency, particularly by the province of Yunnan and the city of, of Kunming. Uh, Kunming also hosted the first phase of COP15, if you recall. So there are uh, many initiatives, announcements, and outcomes delivered uh, at the seventh city summit. Particularly, we welcomed more, uh, uh, say, 36 new cities and five new global partners joined the Cities with Nature, which is recognized by the CBD sector as an uh, official platform to uh, uh, promote the local subnational actions and also uh, officially launched the regions with nature uh, uh, as a partnership initiative for regional governments. Uh, in addition, the summit also witnessed the, the announcement of creating a ICLE Kunming Joint International Center of Excellence for Cities with Nature, which will be an arm uh, hosted by Kunming City in China to promote the engagement of Chinese cities uh, and, and local subnational governments for engaging in this global uh, partnership. And also before the summit, we hold a high level round table convening uh, all this participating senior leadership to discuss uh, the major outcome and also uh, the, the future uh, outlook uh, after the COP15. So these are some photos from the pavilion uh, uh, days. I say that uh, there are also some featured days for Montreal and also Quebec Day, as well as one dedicated China Day, uh, participated by uh, 12 Chinese subnational and uh, local governments. There are a number of key decisions adopted at COP15 that are relevant to local and subnational uh, governments. I'm not going through all of them, but say that these are very much uh, relevant also to the global uh, uh, action-oriented targets, you know, under the new uh, framework. Uh, there are two, like say, targets 12 and 14 that are directly relevant to urban and uh, 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 densely populated areas, you know. Say, for example, the uh, uh, the Tag 12 urges for increasing areas, quality and connectivity, and improving access to and benefits from green and blue spaces in urban areas. Target 14 aims to ensure biodiversity is mainstreamed really into policies, regulations, planning, and different strategies within across all levels of governments. Target 7 also, I mean, there are also targets where are indirectly connected with the cities and uh, and subnational governments who can make a contribution to the implementation, you know, particularly related to say uh, 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 pollution uh, reduction, restoring, man maintain, and enhance nature's contribution uh, by applying nature-based solution as such. Uh, also, targets that are uh, 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 you know summarized uh, as thirty by 30 deals, you know, that are also very much relevant to local and subnational actions. Uh, one thing I want to mention here is that uh, uh, the CBD COP15 uh, adopted a renewed decisions on a plan of action uh, for subnational and local government. This was based on the previous plan of action adopted at uh, COP10 in 2010. And this new plan of action lay the foundation for the future engagement uh, and also actions by subnational local governments under the new global framework to support the parties and also their uh, local subnational governments for the implementation, but also facilitate increased involvement and engagement of local subnational governments in the national biodiversity strategy and action plan revision, implementation, and reporting, but also. Uh, try to encourage uh, the uh, sustainable use and management of biodiversity and also providing more ecosystem services uh, and mainstreaming biodiversity in urban planning as well as uh, development. So how cities and subnational governments can support the implementation of the new global uh, framework? First, they could align the priorities and actions on biodiversity and ecosystem restoration 
with their respective uh, national biodiversity strategy and action plan, the MBSA. Secondly, as just mentioned, there are a, a number of uh, global targets are relevant to local subnational governments. So they could prioritize and implement projects, programs, and measures that are contribute to uh, the realization of these targets. Thirdly, uh, local and subnational governments could mainstream biodiversity considerations into land use, special plans, and de decisions on infrastructure delivery, as well as collaborate with the national government to develop action plans to implement the plan of action and encourage them to identify, enhance, and disseminate policy tools, guidelines, financial mechanisms, or instruments and programs that could facilitate local actions on biodiversity. Lastly, the, uh, uh, you know that the, there is also a CBD advisory role committee on local governments and biodiversities. Local governments are encouraged to voice their concerns and uh, promote their contributions and the best practice actions through this mechanism to the CBD sector and also to parties. Well, in, in, in the last part, I want to give you also a brief update about the Chinese local government's uh, actions you know, from the regional perspective. Uh, since the adoption of China's uh, NDSAPs in 2010, actually more and more local governments are taking actions to playing a growing role in local biodiversity conservation by mainstreaming biodiversity in their planning processes. Um, and we see also an increasing number of Chinese local subnational governments have announced their subnational or local, uh, say, biodiversity strategy and action uh, uh, plans. So far, there are more than uh, two thirds of the Chinese provinces have announced or adapting their uh, regional uh, uh, biodiversity strategy and action plans. You know, I, I clearly remember two years ago before the COP15, there were only less than 10 Chinese cities have their LBSAP, local uh, uh, biodiversity strategy and action plan. But now I see an increasing number, including those we are meeting recently, they are working uh, or already announced uh, during and after the COP15. So we see a new impetus and the momentum driven by this COP15 and also the adoption of the new global framework at the local level uh, in China. Um, also, of course, partly because that China was the presidency and national government has taken a strong push you know, for local government to be engaged and taking actions. Some may heard that there is also a China national strategy called ecological civilization. Under that national strategy, uh, many, uh, I mean, all the Chinese provinces uh, or regional governments are required to set up their ecological red line. That is a very strict uh, uh, policy for local uh, and subnational government to uh, 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 to to protect a certain uh, areas. You know that within this uh, uh, red line, and also uh, we we also observe an. Uh, 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 increase in uh, participating in international cooperation activities. For example, this time there were 12 uh, local and subnational governments from China participating in the Montreal uh, 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 COP15 and also the City Summit, but also more are joining different type of international projects. You know, say we announced uh, the Ikle Kunming Joint Center, and also now three Chinese cities are joining this interactive bio projects, hopefully to uh, uh, provide more support and opportunities for their engagement or set a good example for more Chinese cities to uh, refer. So uh, th there was uh, six cities uh, from China also being awarded as uh, biodiversity charming cities, but also uh, applied the Singapore City Biodiversity Index and also uh, committed to join cities of nature. This is also the first batch of Chinese cities committed to this very important uh, global platform. And uh, my last slide is showing several of these uh, 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 completed or ongoing projects in different parts of the Chinese cities that are connected with the biodiversity conservation. For example, uh, Kunming actually applied nature-based solution in the restoration of a very famous uh, uh, and, and bigger uh, urban lake called Dench Lake. 
in the Tianjin uh, city, which is in northern part of China next to Beijing. They built an eco city together with the Sing Singapore uh, government support, uh, applying a sponge city concept, which helped the city to address the challenge by urban uh, uh, rainfall and flooding. And in Chengdu, uh, uh, Chengdu initiated an initiative called Park City, which is a very similar concept as a garden city, you know, to promote the, the green development and transformation. Uh, now this Park City initiative has been taken also by the national governments as a national demonstration uh, project. Of course, one of the participating city to uh, uh, city summit, Huzhou City, also was uh, uh, recognized as an international cooperation demonstration zone for ecological civilization, which was also announced at the COP15. And also Hudo is aiming for closer cooperation with ICLE and also CBD Secretary for the Future Biodiversity Conservation in connection with its ecological civilization. So that's all uh, uh, update and also a summary from my side. Welcome the future exchange and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shu, for setting the scene for us so well. And I mean, the, what you highlighted, I mean, already is one of the um, important points, you know, the last year's COP resulted in how local governments, you know, there's so much responsibility that they carry for implementing these targets. Um, and I mean, it's wonderful, obviously, to see the work that you're already doing in China um, to make all of this happen. And now I'd like to then go to Mr. Precious Stone Rapotswa, um, who's the municipal manager for the Waterberg district. So Mr. Mr. Rapotswa, you were at the COP of last year. And I think it would be amazing just to hear what are your insights? And if you can reflect from, you know, your perspective as a city, you know, who will be tasked with actually, you know, making or, you know, making big changes um, in support of biodiversity and really how to localize the GBF's targets in your municipality. Um, I hand over to you, Mr. Rapotswa. No, uh, thank you very much. Uh... How are you, uh, to you and to everyone else? Um, I'm quite happy, you know, to be uh, on this platform, and I also, I think, uh, welcome the input by by, uh, by by my colleague from China. Um, look, I think uh, maybe starting from our experience, really, um. As Waterbed, and uh, of it is something that when we came back, we also shared with a number of our colleagues and uh, family of municipalities within Waterbed. Uh, was the realization, I think, uh, which was more like a, a part of the tone at the, at the COP15 to say, look, uh, 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 issues around biodiversity is no longer a, 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 a matter of, you know, that. People can choose to attend to them or, or not to attend to them, but uh, those are, uh, are matters of that uh, needs our agent attention, not only as local government, but as, as government in its uh, entirety. Uh, more so that uh, in, at local government, that's where uh, most of the, the work of government, together with social partners, is happening. You know, your civil society, your, your business, both big and small, your uh, your, 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 uh, your other uh, stakeholders, you know, uh, 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 religious formations and so forth. And uh, those uh, were uh, vastly represented at the COP15 and uh, to really ensure that the voice uh, of each and every one of those, and you know, even the, your, your uh, uh, Aboriginal or the, 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 the indigenous people uh, in various cities, uh, that their voices are, are, are well shared and uh, they're not left out even when uh, decisions are actually made. And uh, uh, you know, the emphasis of nature-based solutions and actions was uh, also put to the fore to say, look, everything else happened on space and uh, on nature, and therefore uh, we need to ensure that uh, all our decisions as, uh, as municipalities or as cities are uh, actually uh, uh, informed and influenced uh, by 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 actions uh, that um, that uh, will not necessarily uh, 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 
affect nature in a negative way, but will actually complement it and ensure that uh, uh, it, it, it is sort of a thrive and uh, uh, we know that the consequences of a thriving nature in our space would be to have um, uh, all our, our livelihood and our community actually uh, being uh, living lives uh, that are, are, are sustainable and so forth. And also the observation that uh, out of the 17, uh, uh, the 17 um, uh, uh, sustainable development goals, 15 of them are actually uh, 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 linked uh, to, uh, to uh, biodiversity. Now, we tell you uh, that actually uh, biodiversity is, is, uh, is, uh, is about our life in its entirety as, 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 as a people and uh, in the spaces in which we live or use, uh, you know, for our, our day-to-day business uh, activities, for our living and all those other matters. And therefore, we need to ensure that uh, we, 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 we take care of that, but we bring each and every stakeholder, uh, uh, you know, uh, those who can enable our decisions in, from the funding perspective, and also those who can enable uh, uh, our decisions from the policy uh, 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 perspective be it your national, your uh, sub-regional uh, government, and so forth. And uh, in our context, and uh, I think uh, when you look in, in, in South Africa, Africa, and there's, uh, there, there already there's a move towards, uh, you know, a uh, nature-based kind of solutions, uh, 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 and ultimately, uh, which will then uh, lead to the implementation of the target that outlined in the GDF, uh, where we, uh, we, are, uh, and, uh, we are saying, let us uh, uh, move towards green development, you know, uh, and begin to uh, ensure that uh, we take nature-based solutions. And uh, I think recently in our country uh, uh, and other parts of uh, Southern Africa, uh, that will also necessitate further, you know, from your how uh, your, 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 your flood uh, or heavy rains and so forth, uh, you know, the the uh, the the, the uh, for which uh, further necessitated. Uh, but of push us towards a, 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 a correct direction of responding or ensuring that our mitigation strategies towards, uh, uh, towards uh, climate change are actually intentional as opposed to before where maybe we were taking a, a, a perennial approach, maybe hoping that things will at one point in time uh, uh, get sorted, you know, but uh, only to, uh, to be uh, awakened by nature itself, but actually, it is us who are supposed to uh, respond to, uh, to, uh, to those if we want to continue to, uh, to, to benefit uh, to, uh, from, from nature, uh, be it uh, on land uh, or any other uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, where we find ourselves and where we, where we develop or we, we fulfill our livelihoods and so forth. So the lessons really that were learned there, uh, I mean, also the fact that we had to uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, take a decision to say, no, uh, let's be a part of the family, you know, within the uh, city with change. Uh, I mean, with city uh, uh, with, with, uh, with nature, you know, where we say we want to be central in terms of ensuring that we leverage the opportunities that nature uh, presents to us as cities, uh, while at the very same time taking care of the very nature in which we are, so that it can be able to take care of us as we move forward. and. You know, I always say uh, I, I like um, that um, uh, when uh, 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 the Franklin uh, Committee uh, looked at uh, the sustainable development saying it is our ability uh, to use the current resources without compromising the capability of fish generation to use the very same resources. And that actually uh, uh, brings it home, you know, in terms of how we respond and linking all this. Uh, uh, towards, uh, you know, all the, the other uh, uh, national and international targets that we have. And I think the GBF captures it quite well, you know, pulls it all quite well, you know, within the integrated kind of a, of a frame, you know, uh, where, where we, we move away from silo response in terms of uh, our, our interventions. But now, this in, uh, at this point in time, predicating everything on, uh, on nature, uh, uh, or, or nature-based solutions uh, uh, for the sustainability of our cities and our sub-regions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rapotswa. I think, uh, yes, such, such, um, such insights. I mean, you know, just how relevant it is. 
you know, to have the awareness, um, you know, already at local level of the value, the value of nature. I mean, how to now harness nature-based solutions. I mean, and I think also just the relevance of nature when we speak to our livelihoods. I mean, we are intertwined and it is impossible to kind of um, look for development at the expense of nature. And I think that really is really at the heart of why mainstreaming biodiversity, even at a policy level and obviously at, at a local implementation level is so important. And I mean, what we've gathered also is that, you know, what that really means um, isn't always necessarily understood. And it, it leaves decision makers almost, you know, like, well, what do we do with these things? Um, and I think with that, I'd like to go to um, our next bit where we have a bit of a panel discussion with our speakers who have um, joined us and will contribute some of their insights. I mean, they um, come from a range of places. And um, for now, I'd like to just um, address this specific question to Ms. Maria Saad. Um, I mean, they have been participating, uh, you know, and doing a lot of tremendous work already. Um, and in the city of Barranquilla have, you know, kind of already got lots of reflections and experiences, you know, of the importance of biodiversity in nature. Um, I believe you also were la um, at COP last year, and it would be great for us to have an understanding, you know, of what it actually means for a city, you know, as it enhances um, you know, biodiversity mainstreaming agenda and how, how actually to go about it. Over to you, Maria. Good morning, evening, afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you for the question, Ursula. Yes, as you mentioned, um, as we are talking a city of like Barranquilla, a city and a third world country where we have many other challenges. So, uh, we have some social, economical, uh, environmental, but also infrastructure challenges. How do, how do we start talking about the importance of biodiversity? And how do we integrate it in our agenda and our policies? Uh, for us in Barranquilla, our main understand, like what we learn is that first of, of all, we have to put it like in the top of the topics. That's when we include it in our development plan that it's a four year ongoing development plan of the mayor of Pumarejo. Uh, we make it a policy. When we make it a policy, uh, we also are talking about some programs and projects that have already a budget, uh, a city budget on it. So let's say that we already have some public resources that are, uh, toward, uh, that are allocated to, to, to build, it, build them and, and complete them. But also, we have to be really strategic because how, in which uh, programs or projects can we invest that have a bigger impact? We can, like, we have to impact in society, but also in eco uh, improving economical problems. Uh, so that's when we start to identify like a big project that is like our, like where we wanted to start. That is the restoration of the Mayor King Swamp. Uh, we are located in a delta where the Magdalena River and the Caribbean Sea meet. Uh, we have a big swamp in, in between that it's an, uh, it's, it have an important role um, for the city. Uh, so we have to, we start looking at it, mainly by looking at it, identifying that we have that important ecosystem in our territory. Uh, and also understanding that this is one of the main um, things we learn is that, okay, we as talking about city uh, policymakers and everything, we can start talking about it, but if we don't integrate the community, if we don't integrate citizens to learn and know that we have these spaces in our city, then it won't last, uh, mainly because of the all other problems that I've already had. So we have to, um, we have to approach into that with a big problem that is the renewal, but it's that it's come, the composition is from seven bigger projects. Uh, these projects are already under in a feasibility. Uh, that means we are talking on a long term future uh, projects uh, that it's um, the idea is that the next government or the future governments can continue in it. As we already put it in the in the plan, we are already talking about it. And uh, this uh, identifying this first big project can uh, lead us or gave us the opportunity to make it. We also, uh, with this renewal project, we have some social impacts 
because we have two neighborhoods that have historically lived from the swamp, from the Mallorquin swamp, and that have historically lived in a, let's say, like more, that have like, um, we have some illegal settlements around it that have like affect the ecosystem. We have some mangrove logging. Uh, so we have to stop, like we have many, many problems happening around the ecosystems. So we have to integrate all of them in this project. But also, as I mentioned before, our main idea was, okay, how do we make that people, the Barranquilla citizens, uh, can know about it and can protect and can understand why it is so important to start talking about biodiversity in the city development plan. And that's when we uh, identified that it was, the idea was to have some public space. Uh, that's when we built it, we, we planned it, an eco park. So we can um, ap approach into the problem from like different aspects, the economical one, because as this is an eco park that will be in the swamp, we will uh, improve and give some opportunities to the community and the surroundings. Also did made us, the, the, the local government made us to have some um, like uh, consolidate or see these neighborhoods and apply some more of the public services and improve their quality of life. Also the restoration of the water, the, of course the mangrove logging, and so um, at the end, we, we, this, we believe, and the city, yes, we believe that this could be the beginning of, the, of, the, of, of, um, of change on how it, it will be approached. Also right now, as we, are already, we already started, let's say like here in Colombia uh, or here in Barranquilla, what we want is, okay, it's not only an initiative, but how we make it a project, how we make it a reality. So all the cities have been working on it. And as we make the, we give the importance to this and include it, as I mentioned before, with some other aspects uh, of the city, of some other problems we have, like not only re the restoration and protection of the of the our main ecosystem, we are already giving the importance it has, and we are already making people talking about it. And just to make people talk about it and and try to and ask, like, okay, what 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 do we have there? Why is it important? What's happening there? What's the city doing there? Like, why are the city looking at that uh, ecosystem and why it's so important? We are already making a difference um, because we have to make people to believe in it. And that is not only, as I mentioned before, just an idea or an initiative, but if we, uh, if we <clears throat> work towards it, then we will, we will find um, and we will, we will change the way it has been doing uh, for before. Because something I didn't mention is that that space that I'm talking about, that ecosystem, was was forgotten for the people in Barranquilla. No one knows about it. No, one, and it's and it's amazing if you see it from from Google Earth. Uh, it's amazing the location, what it does, so what it do, uh, like the the yes, what it do to the to the, our city and how it protects us from mainly the climate change. Um, uh, yes, but we will happen. So. For us, doing and looking at it in a different way was like uh, like like the first step on this change on how we approach biodiversity. And the idea is what well, that we have is that we this project will continue because it's a long term plan, uh, but also that it can become uh, a replicable that some other cities can learn from it because we are not doing like a it's not like really superpower what we are doing is just understanding our surroundings, identifying our ecological infrastructure, and hazing it, but integrating in our lives, like integrating and knowing that without affecting it, of course, like enhancing the protection and the restoration, but telling the people that is no, yeah, like they mainly in cities, people don't don't look at some of the uh, green infrastructure as the important they have, like change that that kind the that um idea so we think like in this like um yeah how we approach into this ecosystem will change and will make the difference and also people already we are people already can look at the difference we have already partially restored the quality of the water with some algaes of course the project is bigger and it's like a long-term project 
We also have already started the eco park building. So the people and this year will be open like the two first parts. So the people is already asking what's there and like planning. Okay, we have to go to Barranquilla, and also we can. We have seen like the the impact in the how the multilateral corporations and entities have already worked with us and are believing in the project because they are seeing what is happening and the importance. So we have we are working with the IDB, with the World Bank, with um, Conservation International. We are right now working to, with many other many stakeholders, uh, of course, depending on the topic, and in order to start and to like to begin and giving this the the importance it has about talking biodiversity in our development plan and in more in a city of Barranquilla as we have a really strategic location. Brilliant. Th thank you, Maria. I mean, it's super exciting. I mean, but also what you've just brought to us, you know, that first-hand experience, the transformation, but the highlights of, you know, also or rather the relevance and the importance of saying the social impacts, you know, the link to livelihoods, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not just for the environment, but it's, it's for human beings, you know, and again, it comes back to um, we are interconnected, intertwined, and the ecosystem services generated, obviously, by biodiversity, you know, and putting it to such a good use. I, I love that you're saying, you know, what you have been putting in place, especially from the longer term kind of planning. I mean, that speaks to continuity. And then bringing people, you know, into the space and getting the awareness and the excitement going for it. Um, I think that's wonderful. So thank you very much for sharing these insights. Um, and I think another city that's really a front runner with the work that they are doing um, for biodiversity, I mean, at least what we've also been seeing is um, the city of Campinas. And today, uh, today, I'd like to then address this one to Dr. Giaro. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's so much Campinas is also doing. Um, you know, it's been um, contributing to kind of um, the environment and obviously the global biodiversity frameworks, you know, kind of targets for quite some time. Um, we quite interested in what your take home message then was from COP15, but also we know you, I mean, reporting your actions on the Cities with Nature platform. You know, how do you intend to leverage the Cities with Nature network, you know, to, to kind of demonstrate this project? I mean, you, you're a front runner in our eyes, and how do you plan to continue to do these things? Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking the invitation of the play, and uh, I thank all the speakers, and thank you, Ursula, for the questions. Uh, Campinas is a city in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil, with 1.3 million inhabitants, and the seat of the metropolitan region of Campinas with 20 municipalities. At Campinas, at COP15, Campinas had the opportunity to participate in different sessions that dealt with the importance and the role of local governments in the biodiversity agenda and the implementation of the global biodiversity framework. These discussions the spaces, along with other cities, addressed urban nature-based solutions, seats as drivers of nature-positive development, health and well-being in seats, actions for access to green and blue spaces, the why and how of mainstream biodiversity at the seat and the landscape level, biodiversities, Latin America at the forefront of biodiversity conservation and climate action, seats and sub governments as agents of change, new ideas and influence transformative change to support at GBF at the local and the landscape level. So I brought these examples to illustrate some of the talks addressed at the COP15 with a focus on seats and showing the range of issues that are in the hands of the seats. It's important to point out that it's the, at the local scale that the responsibilities, possibilities and opportunities for implementing the necessary change for the recovery and conservation of a biodiversity line. Also, the signing uh, of international agreements and commitments 
the foundation of actions through federal and state le legislation, planning as a municipality its own le legislation, guaranteeing technical and financial resources, environment and territorial planning, and the engagement of the population in the beginning of this change can happen. But specifically about the question, Ursula, how does Campinas intend to implement the GBF? I can see some examples. Uh, first, preservation of 30% of the municipal territory through the establishment of protected areas as the conservation unit. Implementation of linear parks as a, mean, uh, as a means of environmental recovery combined with the promotion, the promotion of the social function, ecological and social function. Septic tanks on rural properties, it's the rural sanitation. Payments of environment services program, implementation, implementation of another nature based solutions as rains gardens, integration of nature based solutions and ecosystems based approach into urban infrastructure maintenance and development. And the reforestation uh, in the last 10 years, more than 400,000 trees were uh, planted. Implementation of ecological corridors to guarantee connectivity, including the implementation of fauna passages. Control or eradicating invas uh, invasive alien species uh, and prevent their introduction. And uh, the, the part social uh, as environment education actions in schools and increasing environment education centers. And the straightening and the partnership with the municipal environment councils. In the case of Campinas, these actions are replicated to programs such as the Reconnecta RMC program in partnership with the Interactive View uh, project coordinated by ICLEI in the 20 municipalities of our metropolitan region. Another important point is the work through partnerships and with a multi-level agenda. Thus, Campinas has a partner as the Metropolitan Agency of Campinas, the State of Sao Paulo, and the Piracicaba, Capivari, Jundiaí, and Jundiaí River Basis Committee, public minister of, of state of Sao Paulo, and the municipalities of the metropolitan region of Campinas at a re regional level, and ICLEI, WRY, and GIZ from the third sector, and university and research, research centers. Finally, Finally, the environment plan associated with the urban planet has the potential for sustainable transformation of the territory. Campinas, in a strategic way, integrated the environment and municipal plans in, in the master plan, bringing the need, the need and the location for the implementation of green and blue spaces and the nature-based solutions into our start in the local cl climate plan action. We started it yesterday. Regarding uh, seats with nature, about the platform, Campinas has one of the first seats to enter the information on the platform since 2019. For us, the platform has an important role uh, in storing, sharing with other seats and provide transparency about the path already taken by Campinas. The, the platform is made public and this is so important. On the platform, it was possible to insert documents referring to urban and environmental legislation, the agreements and commitments assumed by the municipality in the climate and biodiversity agenda, uh, reports for the seeds activities. Also, by inserting data in, into the platform, we can define goals compatible with the GBF and verify that are meeting the main actions of protector and restore nature. In this sense, the participation of Campinas in the COP15 included the presence of, may, of our mayor, uh, Dario Saad, reinforces the city's position and the responsibility to the implementation of the GBF and the inclusion of biodiversity in a transversal and interacted manner in the various municipal public policies. Uh, so, and as a city on the seat with nature, we, in the, we understand that the platform is important to, to follow the progress of Campinas in relation to the goals and our commitment in the implementation of GB, GBF. So thank you very much. Uh, and I am remaining at the disposal for any question. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Obrigado. Um, the, uh, I think it's just great, I mean, to hear, obviously, um, you know, the, the steps, the actions. I mean, it's all about doing. You know, these, these targets aren't going to materialize themselves, you know, and I think there's, a, there's so much at stake. I mean, we all know about the biodiversity crisis that, you know, we are experiencing globally, and they are in, ambitious targets. And we will only be able to chip away at these with the dedicated and intentional actions that Campinas have, has demonstrated. And I think it's wonderful um, to obviously hear this and to be able to learn from that. Um, I think it's, it, it, it's really so valuable. I mean, especially if I now think that in our South African case, and I'm here, I'd like to again circle back to Mr. Rapotswa. I mean, you are our, um, the Waterberg district. I mean, and it, it, it forms a district uh, well, rather, there's a district development model in South Africa. So the Waterberg district, you know, is essentially five local municipalities. Now, I mean, we are also quite curious to hear from you, Mr. Apotswa, you know, what does the Waterberg district now intend to change? You know, what will we see at the local level, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the municipality reaching some of these targets? I mean, we've now heard from Campinas, and it would be great to hear what you plan to do. No, th thank you very much. Um, I think within the context of DDM, um, but, uh, DDM itself is more of a, a, a vehicle, if I may put it that way, the model it was to mobilize the or for, for partnerships from uh, across different stakeholders, uh, you know, business, government, and uh, of, uh, civil society. Uh, to say, let us plan together, let us uh, also put uh, our resources uh, into a one basket uh, for meaningful and impactful kind of, a, 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 of an impact, you know. But as well, uh, it is to intend what uh, the White Paper on Local Government, which is uh, one of the legislation found, that found that municipalities in the country, that said, uh, people uh, must actually be the drivers of uh, their own uh, development. Uh, uh, but in the context of a, a, a now a, a mainstreaming a GBF within the GBM, it's a, 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 it's a, it's a matter of saying, uh, we are through uh, the integrated development plans of municipalities, which are the strategic uh, planning and development instruments in the municipalities. Uh, uh, then resourced, of course, by all these different stakeholders that we have said. It's a matter of saying, uh, uh, for example, one of the things is to say, uh, let us invest on uh, green, uh, let's say from the town planning perspective, or uh, even uh, infrastructure development, uh, let us uh, 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 move uh, towards green building or green development. That means uh, that on its own begins to say now we are um, uh, moving towards nature-based uh, uh, solutions uh, in terms of our, our infrastructure development, in terms of our land use or our planning in general, uh, uh, as well as uh, to, 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 to say let us also uh, uh, move towards a direction where we, we, we are now cleaning our spaces, you know, uh, so that we, 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 we allow nature to be able to, to self-regulate in terms of Amongst other things, you know, uh, mitigate or mitigate, you know, uh, 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 I mean, uh, 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 poor quality of air in our spaces. So let us uh, 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 introduce uh, 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 instruments and systems that will actually ensure uh, a high increase of carbon, carbon, I mean, uh, I mean, oxygen into our into our spaces. So a uh, less of a concrete kind of uh, uh, on our on our open spaces, but more of uh, green spaces and also uh, encourage now uh, the households to uh, to move more into you know your vegetable garden uh, uh, in their uh, backyard and so forth to uh, to ensure that there is that uh, freshness uh, uh, into our 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 air and so forth and uh, on the other side of business uh, I think we have done quite a number of partnerships as well with you know institutions of higher learning where for example uh, because we have quite quite a number of um, uh, you know um, uh, one of the, uh, the biggest power stations, uh, coal power, power stations within our state in the Palale. And the way they are, of course, uh, you know, the level of uh, then uh, pollution and all the other matters are quite high. 
but then uh, from the side of the, uh, the, 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 the national grid operator to say, uh, let, uh, let's invest more on uh, clean energy uh, production and uh, uh, technologies. You know, that means, I think they used to have it before the Pebble, um, a Pebble uh, a system, I think. So they are looking at actually bringing it back to ensure that then uh, your air quality becomes uh, better uh, and supportive to, you know, to, to, to your nature-based solutions and also among a response to uh, in, uh, international kind of uh, level in terms of uh, the agreements that are there. But uh, as well, uh, I think, you know, in, uh, in partnership with uh, your, your Council for Geoscience, where they said, okay, we are uh, at one of the, the, our high priorities, which is uh, within Bumalanga, they have done in, a work on uh, uh, um, a carbon capturing, and I think we have a great into our space. Let's also do that, uh, that as well, so that we also uh, invest into that. And of course, uh, with your, your, your business, uh, the bigger minds have actually gone the route of hydrogen, um, uh, I mean, uh, hydrogen trucks, you know, uh, where, where now you are moving away from um, uh, having to use uh, uh, high volumes of, you know, your, your, your diesel and all those other things which might actually have, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, or also contribute to us, uh, you know, uh, con uh, con uh, I mean, uh, air pollution and so forth. But uh, as well, there are also other uh, stakeholders, you know, in terms of uh, around issues of awareness, you know, where uh, in terms of uh, how uh, uh, of uh, collecting of ways to minimize, uh, you know, uh, uh, the littering of plastics and other uh, unwanted uh, materials that can, might actually be uh, sort of like swept into the river streams and so forth, uh, or you uh, to the point where by now uh, they affect the your other uh, species that might be there. And uh, what happened uh, as well about 75% um, of it is actually within a, a, a UNESCO um, a bio, a, a bi a biosphere, you know. So we can tell you uh, uh, most of our development must actually be supportive to the biosphere being, uh, uh, being there and to be uh, really what uh, originally intended to. Uh, uh, even if you have the, uh, other forms of businesses uh, from the mining perspective, which are our strong point uh, to the with, with tourism, we need to ensure that then they, 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 are, they, 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 they do not necessarily uh, 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 contradict uh, or reverse uh, the gains of, uh, of us being a biosphere. Uh, hence, uh, we, while uh, with our special development framework, Whilst we, 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 I mean, we, 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 we allow other forms of development, uh, key uh, among the, the decisions that are supposed to uh, are made are uh, the, the uh, development that will actually complement uh, the fact that the, uh, the bigger part of what happens is, actually, uh, is, is a biosphere. Um, and I think uh, we, uh, in partnership with also uh, professional bodies, uh, we are also now uh, engaging more on uh, a, a, a redevelopment initiatives that uh, sort of like uh, 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 sensitizes them in terms of uh, you know the, the, the impact of nature or the significance of nature within their profession so that when they uh, uh, sort of like if you have planners or you have engineers you know or you have accountants when they take decisions they must uh, 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 be conscious uh, of the environment uh, 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 for example, among other things uh, uh, we are uh, now implementing is that of digitizing the work of government. That means you are saying let's kill less of the, or contribute towards the killing of trees in terms of showing that we move, uh, 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 we digitize our meetings uh, of council, council committee, and across the whole of Waterbeck, I think that's the perspective we are going to. And also, uh, 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 you know, uh, a number of applications that are happening there. So you, you do less, less paper, paper uh, in terms of the operation. So that's uh, uh, the model that uh, within the context of DDM, we have actually uh, put in place and we are also uh, sharing with our, our PM municipalities across the country in terms of uh, how we, we go about it. And of course, uh, uh, as a consequence of um, our participation at the uh, at the uh, COP15, uh, uh, you know, with other other cities that actually have, uh, have moved far ahead of us, we are able to share uh, th those lessons and uh, 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 take those lessons into our space to ensure that then we, we build on that. And I think supported by uh, uh, Italy as well, 
uh, so, uh, so, uh, so one of the pilots uh, in the country, we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, leveraging uh, that support uh, to even uh, optimize uh, some of the initiatives that we do. We have plans in place, but we think with the, with the fact that uh, we are being piloted, we will be able to even to improve even better, you know, to, to ensure that uh, uh, asking a pilot, DVM pilot, who will actually become a learning port or a part of, uh, you know, a, a benchmark from our fellow municipalities, both in the country and uh, in the continent as well. Thank you very much. Love it. I mean, to, to hear that as you speak of yourself and the work as a pilot, but already sharing that, you know, with the fellow districts, you know, um, for colleagues who might not know the South African context as well, um, the Limpopo province where the Waterberg district is uh, falls within is adjacent to the Mpumalanga province where there's a big focus on work specifically around our uh, national just energy transition um, and also, you know, what we're going to do with the coal mines. And to hear you, Mr. Rapotswa, already speak of how you're bringing in the greening element into your, um, you know, um, special development planning, you know, and how all of the work that you're aiming to do around also just the biosphere. I mean, for me, that just already speaks to the targets of the GBF, you know, 30, 30 by 30. And yeah, it is really, it's, it, it's so exciting to hear what, you know, each different region is doing. And before I um, come back to Shu for some more of their experiences in East China, I just want to remind everybody that we have our chat function. Um, if you've not done so, please, please put your name, uh, where you're from. We're very curious to know where everybody is joining us from. And also, if you have a question, um, if you have a question uh, please also pop that into the chat um, that that you can address them to our speakers specifically so uh, please do so um, and then uh, without further ado let me go back to our last question for our panelists and you know this one again for you Shu just really with your experience that you've um, in East Asia had um, you know, what are the opportunities that you think, you know, there are there for cities to overcome some of these challenges? I mean, you already demonstrated, you know, beautiful images of transformation, and I think there's definitely some lessons you could share there. Thank you, Ursula. Um, I think the uh, cockpitting and also including those um, agreements and decisions, uh, uh, such as the uh, renewed plan of actions, actually open door and uh, open eyes for many of the local government leadership to see uh, the way forward for conserve urban biodiversity, but also uh, the direct benefits of uh, conserving nature and to uh, 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 cope with this various urban challenge. You know. So in China, uh, previously, the, 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 the um, topic of urban biodiversity was uh, relatively uh, uh, underestimated and uh, emphasized in local policy making because uh, uh, most of Chinese cities and regions have paid too much attention to the urban infrastructure development and also economic transformation, which also causes a, a, a lot of pollutions on the environment, for example, the air pollution, the water and soil, uh, as of course direct impact on the urban biodiversity. And also they, uh, I mean, uh, also at the national level, they also pay much attention on a macro scale of, of conservation. For example, China established very good uh, national uh, park system. And also more than 18% of the national land has been uh, uh, protected areas. That's a remarkable achievement. However, at the urban and landscape scale, this was uh, 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 left behind because of the, uh, the, the limited understanding about uh, the importance uh, and value of, uh, of, of protecting urban biodiversity. And also um, even some of the local leadership uh, may, may, may think that while well, there is no bi biodiversity in urban areas, you know, but only in, in those uh, mountains, you know, uh, uh, wetlands and also protected areas. Uh, and also we see because of the fast urbanization industry relation, you see uh, the, the ecosystem have been uh, fragmented in, in urban and pan-urban areas in most of the Chinese regions. But in recent years, also because of the 
uh, preparation and organization of COP15 in more cities, as I shared in, in my presentation, uh, paying higher in, in, uh, attention to urban biodiversity. And also, um, they want to have more opportunity to, to know how to, to, to uh, in terms of the local policy making, uh, as well as uh, uh, target setting. For example, uh, now more and more cities are preparing or adapting their local biodiversity strategy, as I pointed out. Uh, and also they are also considering the relation between urban biodiversity conservation with their land use and, and urban spatial planning, uh, as well as how to build synergy between urban biodiversity with their climate mitigation and also uh, adaptation efforts. For example, uh, China has another initiative called the Spam City, as I said, you know, they are also largely considering the impact on biodiversity, you know, and also how to uh, uh, utilize the nature as a, a powerful weapon to tackle this uh, urban flooding issues. Uh, but also uh, an, an increase, uh, an increasing um, recognition about the importance of international cooperation, including direct engagement into the CBD processes, you know, under this new uh, global uh, framework. Uh, and through various international cooperation uh, projects, you know. So in, in that sense, this kind of uh, knowledge, uh, uh, best practice actions can also help more Chinese cities and regions realize and enhance uh, the understanding on the, on the importance and the benefits of nature uh, in tackling urban uh, challenges in the development and urbanization process, but also a specific knowledge and tools can be then introduced and shared for local policy making, you know, for more cities to uh, uh, be uh, uh, capable in producing local strategy and actions, and also uh, uh, connecting with other uh, uh, biodiversity of the local policy making processes, including also economic uh, transition, because nature is not only uh, uh, for the local government to, to conserve, but also bring direct benefits, including economic benefits uh, to the to the cities and regions, and also eventually benefiting to the uh, other people to enhance their life uh, quality. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Shu. I think that was um, wonderful insights. Yet again, because, you know, the, I mean, there's no denying there are challenges. It's not an easy space, you know, to navigate. I mean, there's always these sometimes might feel like conflicting uh, development prerogatives and, uh, you know, demands. Um, and it's great to hear that, you know, these are no longer at the expense of nature um, in, in China. Um, and hopefully, you know, through the learnings of this project, you know, globally, you know, we will be able to also kind of scale, as you call, best practice. Um, you know, obviously in support of the GBF's targets. Um, I just want to uh, check in uh, with my colleagues because now we do have a, a Q&A session. I'm at the moment just going to bring up the chat if I can have a look. Um, I see some questions on my side. Um, nothing I'm seeing specifically. Um, look there okay so no specific question in the chat so just check if there is anybody who might have a question for our speakers uh, you're welcome to raise your hand i think if that works okay so if that's not happening i'm going to rather um we can always otherwise um, pop a question. If you do still have a question, you're most welcome to also um, drop us an email um, or even pop, a, pop, a, pop your question into the chat. Obviously, that way we can tackle the question while still live. But in that case, I'm going to hand over to, um, to Ingrid Kutzier, the director of um, the Biodiversity, Nature and Health director, Directorate. And I mean, you, Ingrid, you've played an integral part, um, obviously, in the proceedings, you know, leading up to, to COP15, I mean, in, in preparation, and also, you know, we're really in the thicker things, um, you know, in, in Montreal. Um, it would be great now to also really hear from you how you reflect 
um, you know, and what these highlights for you mean, but also to really hear what does it mean for cities as we go to COP uh, 16? I mean, I know there were some targets or rather we hoped for some targets to be approved and, you know, they didn't make their way into the decision. Um, and I think there's still some, some work that we need to be doing. So um, Ingrid, I think you did want to share the presentation on your side. So I think, yeah. you just, do you have that up? I do have it, but somebody needs to start with my, oh, it says I must start my video. Okay, all right, sorry. I'm just, uh, let me just get there. And then I must share screen. Okay, great. Can everybody see my screen? Um, yes, we can see it. Okay. I think we go to presentation mode. It is in presentation mode. There we go. It is, yes. Okay. It, just, it, it probably just takes a while. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to, uh, thanks very much. It's been really, really very interesting. Um, and in many respects, um, the inputs that we've had from Warteburg, uh, Barranquilla, Campinas, are answering the question that you've asked me to respond to, but let's, let's carry on. Uh, and before I do, I just want to say today is a very exciting day for us, not just because this is the first of our um, our exchanges, city exchanges, um, but also because we've just launched the uh, report um, from the COP, and we call it the uh, report on subnational and city action at COP15. Um, so I will share the link just now. Um, please go and have a look at it. And it's really nice to see so many of the people around this virtual table that we were so privileged to meet in person in um, Montreal. Just want to check, has my slide moved on? Can you see it? Next slide. Okay, great. So, I mean, there were, there were amazing highlights. Um, I think that if we, if we start by just thinking that it, in itself, the fact that we had this, this COP15, um, where it was in terms of getting a new negotiated agreement for this next decade, um, historical, but also the fact that, you know, the, the, the emphasis and the mobilization of cities and subnational governments within a COP uh, with the parallel events that we held there in itself was very uh, historic. Um, I don't know if, if many of you know, but the, um, the, the meeting that we had, our summit, was actually held in the main plenary negotiation hall. And there were many other summits, um, but none of them had the privilege of being in the main negotiation hall, which is, is really significant. And it's testimony to, I think, the the um, understanding and the recognition with amongst the CBD parties, but also the secretariat, that um, cities and subnational governments are not just other stakeholders, they are part and parcel of government and a very important part of it. Um, so the, the summit uh, was hosted by ICLI, as well as um, the secretariat of the convention, um, our, some of our partners, such as Regions 4, and then of course, along with the host governments of Quebec, who was our main sponsor, um, as well as the city of Montreal and the city of Kunming um, and the province of Yunnan. And it was, it was significant also in the sense that it, it was a really incredible mobilization of cities and subnational governments and the commitments that were coming out um, really inspired, I think, not just other cities and subnational governments, but many of the parties that walked in um, and that attended um, our sessions also at the pavilion um, commented to me that it was really incredible to see the action and the, the passion and the ambition coming from, from cities and subnational governments. Also, a highlight if we look at some of the decisions that come out, we've seen over the past decade or so that ICLI has been representing the local government major group um, at COP more and more decisions reflecting uh, uh, the role that cities and subnational governments can play. Uh, this COP was the mother of all COPs in that respect. You can see on the screen all of these decisions that I've highlighted here uh, referenced uh, uh, subnational governments and cities to a greater or lesser degree. In the framework, the global framework, we've got a specific target that's earmarked, and I'll talk just now about that. But there was also this new renewed decision that focuses just that's dedicated to our, our constituency. 
um, with a plan of action and a whole lot more ambitious than in the previous uh, decision that had been taken 10 years ago. And I can say um, it was adopted unanimously, a lot of support from many, many of the parties, um, not just a few, but uh, you know, Canada, Singapore, the whole of the EU and member states, many countries in, in South America, uh, Colombia, for example, the Africa group uh, within the East, also very strong support from many of the countries. Um, if we look at the, the global biodiversity framework and its targets, um, as I said just now, there is a target that's specific to, to cities and subnational governments, and it looks to the whole issue of green and blue spaces, uh, access, uh, benefits from them, so it touches on the whole co concept of sustainable use, brings in the livelihood, the whole issue of connectivity. We've heard some great examples of activity coming from, from Campinas, for example. But there's several other targets that are relevant also to cities and where cities are already making an impact. So, for example, target 14 is the mainstreaming one, uh, which is important because it brings in, I think, um, our, our um, representative from Waterberg was talking about the planning and the, the integrated planning and, and spatial planning uh, role, but this particular target speaks to that and then makes it even more pertinent and says it's about improving the quality of, of uh, cities uh, and the quality of life and the resilience there. The 30 by 30 targets, which are target two and three, are very important because they're two um, cities and subnational governments can play and already are playing a, a, a significant role. And then there's the target that relates to things like reducing pollution risks, uh, restoring and maintaining uh, ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people. Um, if we look at the at the renewed decision, um, I mean that that in itself was a major accomplishment. We uh, we had the incredible support from the UK who had submitted this decision way back in, in the CBD process. They uh, really th sh showed their commitment to multi-level governance. They put forward the draft decision and they really pushed very hard to get it through. And they got, you know, we got a lot of support from many of the countries, as I mentioned just now. And with that support, we're able to really raise the ambition considerably. Um, and you know, have things put into that decision, like you know, the building of capacity, resource mobilization, all of that um, that are that are really, if you compare it to the initial decision, far more ambitious. And I think um, you know, while this decision does provide a, a framework, and one has to understand that the domestic realities and the legal regimes in each country is different, it is an ambitious framework. And Already where I have in, in my own country, for example, been involved with the National Department and their plans for, for implementing the GBF, seeing that there's a lot more emphasis in terms of how they can bring cities and subnational governments on board. And we're seeing this also in, in other countries. Um, the one that we are particularly excited about is within the action plan, and there are seven uh, action areas that are interconnected and that are directly linked to what comes out of the GBF. Uh, there's one that speaks specifically to um, making commitments to reporting and to inc inclusion in the uh, national biodiversity strategies and, and action plans. So I think that that is a major achievement as well. If we take all of that now in terms of what was achieved, what were the outcomes and interpret in terms of what do we need to do now moving from the past COP to the next one, but also get to the end of the decade and make sure that we don't repeat the, um, the, the sort of mistakes uh, of the past where we didn't meet our global biodiversity targets. What is there that cities can do? I think the great news is that the expectation is there and in a sense, it puts a lot of pressure on, on this uh, constituency, but it also opens doors um, because I think parties recognize that they can't do this alone. The whole of government, the whole of society is a very strongly embedded principle in, in this uh, framework. And it sets it in practice by all of these targets and this plan of action. So it's up to the cities and the subnational governments now to, to make this happen in, in many respects. And, and there's a lot. I mean, we've seen in some of the uh, inputs that we've got today, already some of these things have started being implemented and, and then are or else are being amplified or intensified. 
But the obvious one um, is looking at what your current priorities are and how to align those with the uh, actions that are and the objectives that are coming out of the GBF in terms of biodiversity, ecosystem services, the restoration of ecosystems, and aligning that to the national strategies and action plans. At a very practical level, it's around identifying, prioritizing, and implementing projects or programs or measures that can specifically contribute to some of those targets that I mentioned. And, and, that, and that is not, and I think it was Angela who said it's not anything extra or special in many respects. This is common sense and this is good management and good local governance practice. And it's bringing nature, bringing biodiversity into your decision-making and your budgeting and your planning. Um, I think um, our friend from Waterberg, um, Precious Stone Ramaphosa talked about mainstreaming biodiversity. South Africa has a really amazing integrated planning, budgeting, review uh, system in government across all levels. And I think that there's a lot of really incredible stuff that's happening there. And we need to focus more on how we can use our natural assets, our green and blue infrastructure to support many of the uh, municipal or the local infrastructural and services uh, uh, requirements and priorities. Working a lot closer with national governments, I think that is something where we can still step up. I know that in some countries it's hard, um, but I do think that the, the, the sort of foundation, the expectation was set and, and the doors are beginning to open. And then the big call, the big one is to say, join cities with nature, capture your commitments, take concrete action and put those commitments into the action platform. And I'm really glad, Angela, that you referred to some of the stuff that you've done there. I know that um, Baron Kia has also done that, and I'm looking forward to all of the uh, ICLI, uh, the Interact BioCities, taking up that, that challenge. So this is just to give you a little bit of a bird's eye view about the action platform. This is a very special tool. Um, it's recognized in the plan of action, um, and which was adopted uh, as part of the whole global biodiversity framework uh, sort of package. Uh, under decision 1512. Um, and this is recognized as the place, the online place where cities and subnational governments will report and track progress against their commitments uh, to contributing to the, the GBF. We realize these are global targets, so it's not up to the city to necessarily meet that global target, but their local actions can considerably contribute to that. Um, what we've done with the action platform We've set it up in a way so that it aligns with the 2030 action targets, um, but it interprets it um, to make sense to a, a local government situation um, because the functions are different. And we've done it in a way that it can make sense for Campinas, for Kunming, for uh, the Waterberg, for a city in Europe or wherever. So it's obviously done in a way that is not specific. We're also giving cities the option to, depending on their priorities, depending on their capacity and where they are, to either just make a fairly generic high level strategic commitment to, for example, to protect more of their nature, or they can go all the way down and they can set their own baselines, they can set their own targets. And as I said, it covers all the areas from the conservation and the restoration to the sustainable use, to the tools and the implementation measures. And really the next thing that we're wanting to do is make sure that what is happening in our cities gets fed into the national reports to the CBD so that we can get a much fuller and richer picture of what is really happening. So it's not just looking like national action, but that we can actually recognize and see and measure the actions at the local level. This is just a quick screenshot of what these things look like. Um, and if you want more, I see Jade, my colleague Jade is here. She's passionate about this action agenda, uh, action platform, and she would be happy to take you through if you need more support. But I mean, here from, from Barranquilla, we've already seen, that this is just one example um, where they've committed to do certain things around protect, connect, and restore ecosystems. Um, one from Campinas, um, also around um, ecosystems, other um, effective area-based conservation measures, connectivity, et cetera. Kochi, um, Kochi is interesting because we look here also at one around using nature sustainably. 
And there are many more. I haven't got time to put them all in, but really this is something that I want us to push and, and, and trying to get out of this project um, a lot more also. And then just looking forward to COP16, which is going to be taking place next year in Turkey. One of the things that we're doing is to maintain that incredible momentum, is to start already now engaging our cities. Um, and we're tying it up with the World Biodiversity theme this year, which is saying, move from agreement to action, um, build biodiversity back. And we're looking specifically at the role of our constituency in the implementation of the GBF. Um, you see here on the screen, um, there are the dates that we've identified of these webinars. Uh, we've got partners here. The CBD Secretariat is one of our partners. UNEP has come on board. Uh, several of the other partners. We've also identified um, some, some what we call front runner cities um, and we are going to be involving them and as well as many others, uh, as well as subnational governments to really have a high level interventions in these uh, webinars, opportunity for, for panel discussions, for engagement. And you can see there we're taking the different, uh, different themes. This year, we're starting off with City by City. We're talking about connecting the dots that took target 12, practical things that we can do. Finance is an important one. Again, cities with nature, regions with nature, policy tools, et cetera. And then we will continue it on into next year. And as from next year, we're also going to start bringing in the themes around how we're going to position ourselves as a, as a major group, as a constituency in the next COP. What are, the, what are the ambitions? What are the messages? What are we going to report? And that is it. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ingrid. I mean, yes, we really, you know, same cold face syndrome. <laughs> um, but, you know, we um, all have our kind of sleeves up and, um, you know, working really hard to progress this forward. And I think, you know, given what you have also just shared, you know, both as a summary in terms of, uh, you know, the decisions and where we get to play, um, and which is, you know, evidence from today's session is actively already happening. You know, I think it, it, we're looking forward to obviously kind of, you know, moving the needle um, collectively. Um, I'd like to also just take this opportunity, you know, and um, kind of move us um, towards the end of our session. Um, I would like, uh, obviously, first and foremost, really just uh, expressing our thanks to every single speaker, um, to every person in, in who has shared this, who, ha who has shared the space with us and given of their time. Um, obviously, to the team who has organised all of this, sincere thanks to um, each and every one of you. And maybe also as a reminder of our next events, um, we have already said that, you know, this is the first of a, um, of a session of series, and we're very happy to announce that um, our next round is um, has been included as our RISE Africa Action Festival. So you'll see the dates of these on your screen. Um, so on the 23rd of, of, of May, we have the Ramsar Wetlands um, session. It's really, I think, a session that's going to unpack the Ram, Ramsar accreditation for cities, its relevance. And then we have following that on the 25th of May, uh, the reimagining re hope spots, you know, really bringing community action and urban change in coastal cities, you know, on kind of like, you know, the top, top priority, you know, top of the topics. And then um, in the middle of June, we'll be looking at having a session on uh, biodiversity finance. Um, my colleagues are putting uh, links to all of these sessions into the chat for us. So if you are interested in joining any of these sessions, please go and register your attendance. The RISE Action Festival is a jam packed um, with lots of interesting sessions. And I think last but not foremost, well, last but not least, uh, let us also know what you think. Um, we've um, got a little survey and I think that my colleagues have put that up in the chat as well. And without keeping you any, uh, keeping you any further, I'd like to just express my heartfelt thanks, uh, wishing you a wonderful afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you may be in the world and look forward in connecting with you again in this platform. Thanks everybody, bye-bye.